It's podcast time. It's podcast time cars edition. Welcome everybody, friends, enemies, boys and girls around the world, especially the boys and girls that grew up to be men and women that still play with cars. This is the all new motorone.com podcast. Rambling about cars. We are back. We changed the tires. We pulled into the pits. We got a new oil change. We're talking about car news. We're talking about car stuff, but we're doing it with a little more pizzazz, a lot more fun, all kinds of crazy, weird topics that, you know what, should have been discussed a long time ago. And if you want to get news, you can always go to motorone.com. We have the auto news there. We're going to talk about some news here, but we're also, like I said, we're going to put some, we're going to put some fun into it. And it starts today, 2021. Goodbye, 2020. I'm your co-host, Christopher Smith. I'm not the only Chris on this crazy train. No, no, no. I am Christopher Bruce, and to make things easy, he is Smith, I am Bruce. There's no reason to work, com- get two Chris's confused. Let's just make things easy. Um, I well, welcome you all. Eventually, you know, we're, it's, this is going to be so popular, it's going to be like office space. People are going to be like, uh, you've got a meeting with the Chris's? Yeah, I've got a meeting with the Chris's. That's right. I but welcome tell, everyone tell back. Yeah, so we've been gone a little bit. Uh, Our last episode was March of 2020, and the Motor One podcast is now rambling about cars. And what does that mean? Well, it means that there's more personality here now. You know, here's something that a lot of people don't realize. Uh, Smith and I, we write, we generally focus on automotive news. We'll do some features and lists and stuff like that, but we generally focus on news. And with that, We're trying to focus on the facts. We're trying to give you the information that you need in a concise way. Plus, you know, the background and stuff like that. And we'll sprinkle opinions in there, obviously. But we can't go on several paragraph diatribe about why this one part of the car bothers us. Or we can't talk about, oh, why this is interesting from a historical point of view. It just doesn't work. But we can do that here. So that's what we're going to do here. Um, We're going to still talk about car news, but if there's a cool car video, we're going to check that out. If there's somebody cool in the automotive world, maybe that's one of you. Maybe it's someone in the industry. Maybe it's someone with a cool car. We're going to include them. You know, this is a much more loosey-goosey podcast. This isn't just pure dry news. This is two people with opinions and have opinions to share and want you to hear them. And we hope you want to hear them. So we are so not afraid to use them with, with, with some restraint, obviously, because, because we're adults. The last time I checked, I was an adult. Sometimes I don't act like it. I'll, uh, I'll be forthright and say that right off the bat, but you know what? Sometimes we need a little bit of that. And yes, we're celebrating cars, every aspect of cars that includes listeners, that includes automakers. That includes the dude that lives down the street from me that loves his Volkswagen collection. He's he's, he's got to some of the coolest bugs. He's got a, he's got an old bus. We need to address people like that. We need to bring people like that into the limelight. But before Absolutely. we do that, before we do that, Bruce, where can people listen to this crazy podcast? So right now, since this is our first episode, the answer is that's slightly complicated. Uh, If you're watching this, you are likely watching this on either MotorOne.com or the MotorOne YouTube page. If you are listening to this, you are hearing it on our Apple Podcasts, formerly iTunes, whatever you want to call it, feed. Um, In the future, we will eventually be on Spotify. We just kind of have to work some stuff out. It exists, but we got to Put it, put stuff in the right places. Um, so every episode, there will be a post on the Motor One website, and you'll be able to find the video there, and you should be able to find the audio file there, and you'll probably be able to find a short-ish, a paragraph or two description as to what we talked about this week. Um, from there, you know, we we hope you follow us. If you are a former subscriber of the Motor One podcast on um, iTunes, Apple Podcasts. Welcome back. We're glad that you st- you remained a subscriber. Um, and to all our new listeners, welcome. We love hearing from you. Um, I'm you know I'm going to reiterate this at the end, but I'll just go ahead and tell you now. We have an email account. It's podcast at motorone.com. And if you have questions about cars, send them to us. If something we said bothered you, 
send them to us. Be That's nice. Never gonna send them to us. Yeah. That's um, never going to happen. Yeah. That's never going to happen. I'm going to send an email to myself here shortly. If there's a topic you want us to cover, send them to us. Um, we want to interact with you is basically what I'm saying. So podcast at motorone.com. And with that stuff out of the way, let's get into things. How about that? <laughs> well, before we can move forward on the motorone.com podcast rambling about cars, I'm afraid we need to spend just a little bit more time in 2020. I know nobody yeah. wants to do it. Nobody wants to do it. We're, we're gonna we're gonna take the kinder gentler route. We're gonna talk about oh, just partially. Well, okay, yeah, partially. We're gonna talk about and briefly some of the cars that uh, the, that we liked that debuted in 2020, the cars that we didn't like that debuted in 2020. Um, Bruce has his favorite and his worst. I have my favorite and my worst. It's important to note that we're not just basing this on popularity or no. the, the the vehicle that got the most. Uh, most Clicks. attention <laughs> Bronco um, of the year that no, this is, Hey, this is just our opinion. This is the, these are the vehicles that just either give us a thumbs up or a, a face palm. So Bruce, why don't you start with your, what, which one do you want to start with? Your, your best. I'm going to start with my favorite, my the okay. best. Okay. Um, so uh, my thoughts on this were kind of, kind of twofold. There were two cars that debuted this year that I could realistically afford and that I would actually really, really like to own. Um, one of them is the aforementioned Bronco. And the other one is the new Subaru BRZ. And I selected the BRZ for this for a pretty clear reason. And that is just usability for me. Um, you know, I live in Northwestern Ohio. Off-roading isn't something I can really do a lot of. And that's kind of the Bronco's strong suit. Whereas I can select kind of the right roads to get me to the grocery store where I can still have a little bit of fun. And the BRZ would do that for me. So it, it, it's, it, I'll be honest that it's a toss-up, but the the BRZ wins by a nose. Um not that nose, I hope, because I'm still a little torn on, uh, to be honest, on on the BRZ's face. It's just, it's Why? cool, but it looks it looks kind of happy. What's wrong with happy? I I don't want my we've we've kind of discussed this before. I don't want my sports cars to be happy. I want my sports cars to be ah. I want to take that corner. I want to hit the apex. Ah, not. Ooh, look, I'm happy to be out here. Oh, look, there's a corner. Hi, daisies. Hi, people. Yay. It's just You don't see ah. the nose when you're sitting behind the wheel. I see it in my head. Okay. I, I, I hate to say I'm I'm that kind of person. I mean, it's it, it's not bad. It's not it's not Mazda Miata bad. It's, oh, I it's like not, the Miata too. <laughs> it's not, it's so. not, it's not close to Miata bad. But um I mean I'm I'm really excited. I'm glad you mentioned that car because I'm really excited to see the STI. It's if it, it happens. It, 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 if it happens, it's rumored. I think yeah. it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen. I think it's going to be a little bit more bitey. I think it's going to be a little bit more shouty. And on that car, that's kind of what I want. You know, I like it honestly. I kind of like the simplicity of it. I think it's a pretty car, but it's also you know we don't know what it's going to cost yet. We're expecting very high twenties. To, for a base cost, probably twenty nine nine ninety five. dollars To be clear, I don't know that's the actual number, but if I had to guess, it's going to be right around just shy of 30, which is affordable. If it's a, you know, if you're a younger guy, it's, you know, it offers a lot. I like it. Our colleague, uh, Brett, he compared it to the Viper, which I still don't see. And I've looked at a lot of pictures, but I have to admit he's the only one of us that has seen it in person. So maybe there's something vipery when you see it in, per per in I, person. I see it in the headlights a little bit and, and a, okay, little, in the a little bit in the nose, but I mean, obviously the Viper's nose is like three it, times as long, but I mean, there's, yeah, there, it's, there's a little bit there. It, it's, I, it's a happy Viper. I see a little bit more like Lexus RC in it for some reason, especially the back, but I don't know. Um, I, I just really like this car. 
Um, I like the fact that it's got a little bit bigger of an engine. It's a 2.4 liter now rather than the 2.0. So you're getting a little bit more horsepower. You're getting a little bit more torque. Um, somehow Subaru's engineers weight is only up 17 pounds, which is probably what I put on during COVID. So <laughs> if I go on a diet, I can make it weigh as much as a regular uh, first gen BRZ. Yeah, I've 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 done a little bit more than that. I I I have to start my new 2021 program like now. Um I so I have to admit the one downside of this car to me is the interior. I we've talked about this in our team's chat at work and you're going to see it now. That infotainment screen it's a little rough. Like it just looks so it looks like it's 1997 and like you put a tiny Sony CRT in your car. But also I own a Sony CRT from like 99 in my game room. So I'm not necessarily against it. It, it just doesn't it just those harsh lines. They don't really match a lot of the other corners and stuff like that. But I mean, I bet it's a fun car to drive at, you know, Brett who is experienced in these things. And like I said, is the only one of us who has actually driven this car uh, said so, or he was a passenger lap with Scott speed, mm -hmm. but you know, it, it sounds like it's pretty good. I just like it. And uh, like I said, the Bronco and this are the two cars that debuted in 2020 that I could see myself owning. And I only go BRZ because I think I could have a little bit more fun with it, given where I live and the conditions I live in and things like that. I'm pretty sure I could find you some off-road places in, in Ohio. I, I, I have some connections. Oh, of course there are. I, I, I know there are. Not, Northwestern Ohio is a very, very flat place. So unless I'm going through a cornfield or a soybean field that, my options are pretty limited. Well, you could always just dig the pit and go mud bogging. I mean, that's that's the that, that's yeah. the thing that you could always do. And I got to be honest, I'm not an off roader. Okay, I'm generally not interested in trucks. I'm generally not interested in SUVs. But I also like the Bronco. Yeah, I think it's hard I, not to. I, I think it looks great. I think I think Ford did a good job pricing it. Yes. Oh, yeah. You can get into at the kind of low mid levels. The higher yeah. ones get a little obscene, but and hey, if 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 you want that, that's fine. They oh, offer, of course, yeah, they offer on that higher end, for it, but but they make up for it on the lower end, and and just you know, kind of browsing around a lot of the Bronco forms. A lot of people are looking at the Bronco base because it is within reach of a lot of people, mm -hmm. and it still gives you. It still gives off-roaders everything that they want, but I'm not here to talk about the Bronco. Well, wait, wait. before you transition to your best, and no. you know, what do you think I'm crazy about the BRZ for like kind of the new one? Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's I mean, it's not an ugly car by any means. I don't, my personal preference is I don't really like my cars to be that happy. <laughs> and and it just, ignore you know, the I, happiness. A, a, a lot of the design. The to drive it. I, I imagine I haven't had a chance to drive it. Obviously I imagine it would be a wonderful car to drive. The, uh, the current BRZ is, is just a riot to drive. I see no reason why this would be any different other it's than the same it's platform. Have, it's going to have a little bit more power. power. Yeah. yeah. And a couple extra pounds. Like it, you know, it still doesn't have a turbo. Maybe if the STI happens, it will, since they're using that 2.4 liter and they have the 2.4 liter in the Ascent and the Legacy and the Outback. I, you know, I'm not an engineer. I don't know if you can make it fit, but it at least seems, you know, the packaging is there. Um, but even the naturally aspirated one, I think could be fun. So I've said my piece. I think it's time for you to tell me your favorite car of the year. Well, you know, I mean, I did mention the Bronco just because it is, it, it's a very unsmith choice. I'm not big on off-roading, um, but I just, I dig, I dig what they did with the Bronco. I dig that you can get a base model. that still has all the cool off-road features, but I'm not wanting to talk about the Bronco here. I am wanting to talk about the Genesis G80. So Look tell at me that. why. 
just well, just look at it right there on the screen. I mean, for those that aren't watching on YouTube, the Genesis G80, obviously, it has design cues from the GV80 SUV, and I'm not a big SUV guy. And kind um, of the entire Genesis lineup. They're adopting those kind of stacked, slit yep. headlights. It's such a unique look. This day and age, especially with SUVs, it's so hard to really stand out without doing something stupid like a big grill. And here's another very unsmith-like choice. The G80 has a very large crest grill. Actually, it's it's the part of the car that I like the least. I'll be honest. Um, I, I could I could I could see that grill being a little bit smaller, and this car just looking outstanding. But even as it is, um, it's such a striking look for a vehicle, um, and and it looks great inside too. It's it has a very minimalistic interior. I'm really liking the minimalistic look that you get um, with the Genesis products these days. Really, aside from that grill, there's nothing I would change about this car from the back to the front. Just their, their dual slit design is so distinctive. Um, it even has me saying if I was going to get an SUV, the GV80 would probably be it. Um, just just because it has such just such a dramatic styling. And I mean, and I mean, power wise, it also has the uh, what is it? It's the 3.5 liter V6 turbocharged twin turbocharged 375 horsepower i think it's i mean it's not a sports sedan but it's going to have enough power to satisfy sure um it, it's a luxury sedan and if i want to go have some fun i can just buy something cheap and and sporty and go have some fun with that i see myself driving that gv or the, the g80 just all over the place with enough power to satisfy a comfortable ride, but still is aggressive enough to where if I want to have a little bit of fun on some back roads, I can. Um, I think our colleague, uh, senior editor Jeff Perez, drove it, mm -hmm. and uh, and he and I don't agree on a lot of things. <laughs> he's a, he's a, he's Jeff a has a very he's, he's a unique taste. He's he's a, he has he is smarter than most people realize when it comes to cars and, and and he has a very very keen eye uh for what's good and what's bad about a vehicle he loves the gm oh, he, he <laughs> li jeff likes him some big wheels <laughs> he, he likes the he likes the wheels he likes the jimny i'm not a big i'm not oh, a big no Suzuki i'm a jimny guy he and i see oh, I'm not a big Suzuki Suzuki. Jimny. but the, the g80 he loves it and i love it it's such a standout vehicle in admittedly a dying sedan segment. I don't think that segment's ever going to die. And, yeah. and the G 80 is the car that, that I would choose this year, hands down there. There really isn't anything even remotely close and I'm not, I'm not remotely available or able to afford it, but that's not what this is about. This is no. about just picking a car that, uh, that we love. So that, that's my choice. I mean, I gotta be honest. I just, Go ahead, go ahead, lay it on me. No, 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 no. It, it's not that I dislike it. It's just that it doesn't do much for me. And maybe it's because I feel like that Genesis split headlight thing, big grill thing, looks better on crossovers than it does sedans. It just kind of fit. Like, I think the GV80 is the better looking one. If that grill was a little bit smaller and it didn't come to the crest point at the bottom, I think the G80 would look a lot better. It doesn't need a really tiny grill though. Um, and I'm probably the biggest proponent of getting rid of those God awful Walrus grills that are on everything these days, but that car still seems to even, even with that big crest grill, I think it still wears it fairly well. It would look better a little, a little bit smaller. And it, I have to say that photo you showed of the interior, what I like about it is that today, a lot of even luxury cars have kind of tried to become sports sedans. And that interior is very much prioritized as luxury over sportiness. It uh, is. It's, you know, it's a very simple two, well, not simple, but it's a two spoke steering wheel. It's not kind of the sporty three spoke, four spoke signs you see. It's, it's very much more about keeping you and your passengers comfortable rather than like trying to, you know, do a lap around the Nürburgring. 
Um, is it uh, wrong that I kind of want a column shifter in that car? Is it weird? <laughs> is it, it, it? It's a little weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's a little no, weird. No, it's not that way. No, it's a little weird. From. It's you know, it, but I like that though. I like that about it. That you know, most people, the vast majority of people, are never going to take their car to the track or are never going to push their car that hard. So you're way better off. And I don't understand why more automakers don't do this. Build a car that's comfortable on the highway that prioritizes that over lap times or, you know, things like that. Just make something big and comfortable. And that's what I like about the G80. Like for whatever reason, Genesis is, this is going to sound like a backhanded compliment in the modern world. And I don't mean it to be. Genesis is Buick in the 1960s. Interesting. That's a, that's an interesting take. I like where you're going with that because Buick in the 1960s, they had the kind of that luxury thing, but then, I mean, you could get like a, you, you know, know, it's like, not a like, Cadillac. Like, like, like a 455 in something and just, sure, yeah. and just roast the tires for like a, a three quarters of a mile. You know, I, I guess the way I mean that is that it is, it's a luxury car with a little bit of sporting pretensions, but doesn't forget about the comfort of the people inside of it. And I, and I think, and maybe this is an inter- interesting take on just the state of sedans these days. Um, I mean, you make a good point about not every car needs to be really fine tuned for ultimate performance in track. And we're seeing that um, the, the, we're seeing the opposite of that with SUVs now. The SUV is what the sedan was maybe 20 years ago. Yeah. And and the sedan now is more considered of okay, well this is your this is your your harder core sports car with four doors. Right. You can't have a sedan that isn't at least in some form ready to go around the Nürburgring. And you're right. Not every car needs to needs to be that. That said, I I wouldn't mind uh, you know, a uh, a harder core G80. I'm already saying it. But why? I, 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 I mean, why though? Why not just outfit one with all of the luxury stuff? Uh, just because, like you know, because too much is never that. enough. It doesn't make sense. That that's why. That, that's why we are who we are. That's that's why we love cars. It, well, it doesn't. It doesn't always. It doesn't always make sense. I don't make sense. I'm not making sense right now. I want right. a harder core. I want a harder core G80. Even though I'm already in love with the G80 as it is. But what if harder core means more comfortable? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like that that can be more, you know, more in any kind of direction, any quadrant can be better in a certain way. It's so I bring this up because our boss John Neff has he is eyeing Lincoln Continental coach editions, which are the coach doors because he knows they're going to get cheap eventually and they're kind they're going to be cool eventually. Like they will there's so few of them. They made so few of them. It's just, it, it's kind of cool and he's not wrong. So yeah, no, he, he's not wrong. They will be pretty cool. Um, I think they're cool right now, but I've always been a sedan. But I guy. can't afford them right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can afford them. They'll be a whole lot more cool. Well, but, but I mean, there, this raises a question. Will they drop in value that much? Because there are so few of them. I mean, every car has a depreciation curve, like where that, where the, the trough is, it's going to vary, but it's also the fact that the Lincoln brand is in kind of a weird spot. I think that only people who know like us are going to seek them out for a certain period of time. There's going to be a point where they're at the very kind of not the bottom of the trough, but as they're going down where no one's going to realize, and that's going to be the point to snap them up. And then they're going to go back up because like you said, they're so rare that, yeah. But here's the thing. We're so used to Lincoln town cars, right? Mm -hmm. Where, okay. A Lincoln town car was what? Like, I think like 50 or 55 grand at one point at its, at its peak. And you can go buy one now for like, you know, two grand. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, it's just, I mean, we're so used to seeing Lincoln's do that, but here's a car that yes, the it'll, it'll have some depreciation, but I don't think it's going to 
drop nearly as much as people think it will. I think it's going to stay up there because so few are made because it has such distinctive styling from Lincoln's uh, past. And I, I think, I think that depreciation is going to be actually rather shallow. Okay. You know what? They're what? Three years old now. Was that right? We'll wait so, and see. So, so, something Two, like, three, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. This is a, a situation I'm very happy to watch and yeah. see where they are. Because if they get cheap enough, I'll buy one. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Anyway, so tell, tell me, tell me what you won't buy, though. How's that? Yeah. For like? Tell oh, me what you won't yeah. buy. So here, uh, compact crossovers are a huge thing right now. They, I mean, can you can you fight me on that? Like, th that's kind of the hot segment. They are everywhere. Yeah. And so this year, Volkswagen introduced the one that it's going to bring into the U.S., namely the Taos. Am I saying that right? Taos, New Mexico? Isn't that the correct pronunciation? It doesn't matter because I don't like it either. Taos, Taos. I'm not. In, I got to be honest. As an Ohioan, I'm not entirely sure how to say the name of that city. Um, and it's going to be Volkswagen's entry into that segment. And it bores me to tears. I, I don't like, even see a vehicle in this in this photo you have up there. I, I like, see a field and there's there's something that looks very generic in the middle. And, and it kind of depresses me because since Volkswagen's not bringing the golf into the country or into the United States, this is in a way the de facto replacement for the golf. And this thing is just boring. Like. I know we were supposed to select our worst debut. And to me, the worst debut is a car that I kind of sort of forgot about and a car that just does nothing for me. Like it's probably going to be fine, but it's just, it's like they didn't, tr not that they didn't try, but that they tried to emulate um, the Tiguan so much that, they didn't try to give this model any um, personality of its own. It looks like a compliance piece to me. I mean, that, I think that's the best way to describe it. They needed something in that genre. So right. they needed something in that segment. And they're like, well, here we go. And honestly, in that photo, it looks like a previous gen Honda CRV to me. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I can certainly see that. Maybe a little bit of like Jeep Compass, too. It um, looks, it looks like. It looks like everything and nothing. Yeah. And, and you know what? It's not necessarily all Volkswagen's fault because there are so many vehicles in this segment right now. It's, it's exceedingly difficult to try to figure out a way to stand out. Now, Volkswagen, I mean, they've always been rather understated in styling. Of course. And so, so I mean, that's understated and then there's generic, you know, right. And and I would I would agree with you. Well, I'm assuming you're saying that this is this falls on the generic side. I do. I think yeah. that that this is just it's generic. Like if you Volkswagen. saw this right down the road, like I can't see anyone having any passion for this design. And uh, the thing is with Volkswagen in the U.S. that they're kind of they border on a niche brand that it's affordable. But a Honda, a Toyota, a Ford, like there are a lot of brands that I could end up spending less on that might give me more. And so I don't know why I would pick this over any of those. I think Volkswagen enthusiasts or, or, or people loyal to Volkswagen will buy it. Um but I, I struggle to to understand how they would attract a new buyer with that. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, <sighs> like if someone were, I, I just, it, like I'm saying, it it's not a bad car. It's just a boring car. Like, I just don't know. I don't know why I would select this over the other compact crossovers on the market. It, and there are so many to choose from. Well, like I said. I, I see this appealing to people that are already in the Volkswagen family. Um, I just, I just don't see, I don't see anybody else picking it up. I, I agree 120,000% that 
Volkswagen, you can do better. This isn't yeah. bad, but no, you can do, it's you, not you, bad you can, at all. You can, just, you can do better. It's just generic. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't evoke any feelings in me. So that's where I am. Um, so yeah, I want to know what your worst of the year is because I already know, and I kind of disagree <laughs> with you. Oh, you disagree? Okay. Well, th- this this pick isn't generic. Um, I will nope. say that it it's not a generic vehicle at all. You will recognize it instantly, whether you see it or you hear it. That's because <laughs> it's for <gasps> Jeep Wrangler. There it is. Oh my God! Th- this is well. No, you have to. This be is um because some people could be listening to this. It is not a Jeep Wrangler. <laughs> it is a Jeep Wrangler. It, it's Rubicon three ninety two. I said there it had you. a Hemi V eight. There you go. It's yes. It's the twenty twenty one Jeep Wrangler Rubicon three ninety two. Um, former Motor One dot com executive editor Seth Mearsma said it better than anybody else in the entire world, and I'm going to steal his his tweet yet again. OMG, well, I, I, I'm going to paraphrase because I don't think this was exactly right. OMG, this is exactly what I wanted from Jeep to get me to buy a Wrangler, a Wrangler that'll do zero to 60 in like five seconds. Said nobody ever. What, what, th- this made my, my pick has the worst, not because it's ugly. I mean, it, it, hey, it looks cool. It's got a V8. It's cool. Um, it might cost like almost $80,000, which is another story for another time. That's an unconfirmed report. Um, it was what, I think about a week or two ago, um, 78, something, something, yeah. something, as I recall, um, somebody claimed that an order guide or an order, uh, an order form had leaked showing a price of, yeah, like $77,000. We have no idea if that's a fully optioned model, if that's like a first edition, a special model, something like that. Um, to be fair, it sounds vaguely accurate. Like I would believe. Oh, I would totally. There's nothing believe. about that number that I think. Oh no, that's out of the realm of possibility. I, I would, I would totally believe it, just because you know Hemi, and and to to FCA's credit, especially with Dodge, they've certainly made a lot of money on. Hemi and just selling that to people Demon and red eye and at all the things, um, the, the Wrangler Rubicon 392, it's on my list because it's a vehicle that exists for all the wrong reasons. Does I'm, it though? Yes. Like, yes. I don't agree. Who, who, who is asking for a Hemi powered Jeep Wrangler? Yes. There are some aftermarket companies that'll do, v8 swaps but the vast 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 majority of wrangler people they're interested in off-roading they're not interested in going into drag mode and launch mode and taking their wrangler to the drag strip and running it down the drag strip they're not interested in getting to 60 miles an hour in five seconds they're interested in crawling over rocks and getting down trails and in fact when you get into the into the jeep crowd into the wrangler crowd there's even a, a sect that it just completely hates the four door Wrangler because when right. you drive, when you drive a two door Wrangler with a shorter wheelbase versus the four door Wrangler, you realize the four door Wrangler is kind of a poser mobile. And, <laughs> and there starts the first of the chain of emails coming to podcast at motor one.com Smith. How can you say a Wrangler is a poser mobile? The four door, the four door kind of is. They're they're selling that to the people that aren't really going to go off road that much, even though it it can. But I'm I'm, well, I'm wait, getting... wait, I gotta stop you a second. Okay, okay, okay. Is a four door Bronco a poser mobile? You know that's a good question. I'm sorry, it, I my head. it's ahead. a it. I mean, Ford has launched it has a two door and a four door. So, right. I mean, the Wrangler. Back in the in the old days, back when we we're still talking about, really, it was always just a little two door thing that was designed to to, to run through run through uh, you know the forest woods places where there weren't even any trails. Then again, the Bronco was kind of that way too. So, is is a four door Bronco a poser mobile? Well, you know, we'll have to see. You're well, saying I mean, stay we'll, tuned to find out. Well, we'll have to stay tuned to find out. Okay. Um, but the reason the Wrangler three ninety two is here is because Jeep brought this to market simply because of the Bronco. 
of, of what you were talking about. It's nothing more than a desperate response to all of this hype and all of this excitement that Ford has over the Bronco. Correct me. Did they debut on the same day or a day apart? It's close. It was right there. The, well, the 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 three ninety two. Yeah, right. the, the concept. The, I'm sorry. The concept. Yeah, the you're, you're right. Jeep debuted their concept three ninety two same day as the Bronco. It was the same day. Okay. So so right then it's like oh boy okay, Jeep is clearly and rightfully scared as hell right now mm-hmm. because of all of this hype about the Bronco. And when you see that there are, uh, what, I think 190,000 reservations that were in for the Bronco, of course, the that, that's re- reservations, that's not necessarily, doesn't necessarily mean, uh, you know, sales, because people can still back out of those. But from everything that we've seen on our side, I, I mean, the Bronco debuted months ago, we're still talking about it probably two or three times a week. And people still love it. like, And, and people still love it, folks. The yeah. reason you might have Bronco fatigue. We kind of have Bronco fatigue too. The reason we're still talking about it two or three times a week is because people want to read about it. We wouldn't be writing this stuff. We wouldn't be covering this stuff. If, uh, if our traffic, if our stats wasn't telling us, Hey, people are really interested in this. So that is still on the minds of a lot of people. The Rubicon 392, we did the debut post and the then concept, we did, and then the debut, we, yeah. we did the concept. We did the debut post. And then we just did the post recently about it possibly costing seventy seven thousand um, dollars. So there isn't there isn't a lot of hype. There isn't a lot of talk about the three ninety two. It's going to be a vehicle that a few hardcore Mopar people will get. Mm-hmm. The rest that want it won't be able to afford it, and it doesn't fit into the Jeep demographic anyways. And I mentioned this in our in our Festivus airing of grievances before Christmas where. A, a business when you when you answer the uh, when you answer the call of a competitor, you need to be smart about it. You don't just respond. You come up with a plan and you offer something better. What Jeep did here, they just responded. Here's this Bronco. Everybody's talking about this Bronco. There are aspects of this Bronco that are arguably better than the Wrangler. There are aspects that are arguably worse than the Wrangler. Instead of making a better Wrangler to compete with Bronco, they shoved a V8 in it. And not only that, they contradicted themselves from about, I think, a year or two ago when there was talk about putting a Hellcat in a Wrangler. Jeep said, well, you know what? Technically, it fits, but the engine sort of becomes the crumple zone of the Jeep. So I'm really curious to hear how the the Rubicon 392 does in a, you know, in, in a head on crash setting. So it's just, it's, it's very sad. It's very disappointing. It's a very, it's a very clear and obvious desperate attempt on, you know, from my point of view. And I think the point of view of a lot of people on Jeep to just try to do anything that they can to slow down some of of this Bronco excitement. Um, I mean, Jeep sells, I think about 200,000 Wranglers a year. We just got some sales numbers in from 2020 um, just today, I think that had Wrangler selling about two hundred thousand. So now all of a sudden, their their main competitor now that they haven't had any have they haven't had competition for decades. Now all of a sudden they have a competitor that has one hundred ninety thousand reservations. If I was Jeep, I'd be worried too. But I wouldn't be responding with a crazy Wrangler that very few people are going to buy. I'd be responding with something better than the Bronco. That's why it's on my list. I'm going to play devil's advocate just a second. And I want it to be known. I, I agree with a lot of what you said in general. I agree with what you said. A V8 Wrangler is still really cool. (laughs) Like just from, just from a pure, like I like cars point of view, shoving a V8 into a Wrangler just is kind of cool. Also, it should be noted. I live near Toledo and I visited the Toledo factory and so t- maybe I have a little bit of bias towards Jeep. Um, I also learned to drive manual on a Wrangler, but you're not wrong, but I can see why the folks at Jeep, when all of this Bronco stuff was coming out, that, that they decided what's something 
relatively low effort we can do, you know, not to say that there was no engineering in this or anything like that, but obviously that V8 existed on the shelf. The Wrangler existed. Hey, you figure out how to put this into this. Okay. Um, is it really low effort though? I mean, I mean, what all had to go into that Wrangler? I mean, if that, I'm going by what they said like a year, year and a half ago, when they said, you know, from, from a, a point of view of, of crashing and crash standards, and I put in a unit that's very tight. So, okay. And, and I, I, you know, I, I put some feelers out and I never really got an answer from Jeep. So right. anybody from Jeep, if you're listening, I would very much like to know what's different on the 392, um, you know, when it comes to, to head on crashes, what, what's, what's done differently up there. I guess my point is, I feel like this is just the start that Jeep clearly has its hackles up and knows that the Wrangler really, really for sure has competition this time. Like there was the FJ cruiser. Yeah. Has there been anything else? No. Yeah. Like, I mean, I mean, I mean Jeep's kind of had this, uh, you know, this small off-roading segment this to itself been... for a long time. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, you could, you could argue, you know, back in the day with in like the Suzuki Samurais and things like that, but even yeah, though maybe like the first gen, Wrangler and Trailblazer and stuff, or I'm sorry, the first gen Bronco and Trailblazer and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But it's been a while. And, you know, my feeling on this is that Jeep knows they have competition now and they're going to come up with something really good because they know that they have to and that this is just the beginning. And you know, I, I I I have to agree with a lot of your points, but you know, with what they had, they needed to maximize the news cycle as much as they could, and this is what yeah. is the result. But I, but but I mean, I mean, did they did they have to try to dominate the news cycle? They could have just they could have just voted it out. I mean, Bronco was going to be everywhere no matter what anybody did. I think it could be easily said that trying to step in and steal some of their thunder just comes across as has just a ridiculous desperation move. Because I mean, that's what I first thought when they debuted the concept the same day as the Bronco. It's just like, wow, well, that's yeah. convenient. And we all, we all felt that way. Like, yeah. And and now here they are with with a production version that very few people will buy. I mean, you could argue that hey, it, it's a halo vehicle for Jeep. It'll bring more people into dealerships to buy um you know less expensive wranglers i guess the question is were those people going to come in anyways and like i said i i very much largely agree with your point i just wanted to play devil's advocate enough to say this is probably how jeep is looking at things so you know don't misinterpret this anyone that's listening that i'm saying <laughs> but you know I have to be contrary, just, you know, to, why not? I'm Send here. those emails to podcast at motor one.com. That's right. That's the I email know you, I know you have opinions on this. Um, you can, you can join team Smith. You can join team Bruce. You can join right. team Jeep. Um, my team is the team one that Ford. wins. But email us, let us know your thoughts on this. And of course you can catch us on our YouTube channel. You can catch us on Apple podcasts. We're going to be working on Spotify. Yep. Let's, let's, let's move on to uh, a new segment. Uh, let's call it. Yeah. I want to thank everyone who's listening right now. Cause yeah. you know, we're getting started again. I want to thank everyone who's watching on YouTube who can see the images that we're putting up. I want to thank everyone who's listening on Spotify or um, iTunes or what have you. I, I believe we'll be on other services at some point, but it'll definitely be Spotify and iTunes at first. Um, yeah. I, I thank everyone that's here, but it's time to move into a different segment. And, and that is an interesting one. And I will let Mr. Smith introduce it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one thing that we're going to do on this show is, is have some semi recurring segments yeah, um, every once in a while, certainly. This, today we're going to call this one. What the hell were they thinking? Um, and and we're looking at you, BMW, and we're we're going to try to not be too extreme. And I can no, imagine. I, I want to put this out there. I 
am a former, I owned an E30 BMW uh, 325, which was very, very base model. Um, it had the 2.7 liter inline six, the E engine, if anyone's familiar with it. I drove it through college. Um, so I am not a BMW hater by any stretch, but we need to talk BMW. We, we need to have a discussion and we, we sit do. down. It's time. We do. And I'm not a BMW hater either. I've never owned one. I almost bought an E24 several years ago that I was kind of in love with. Um, I'm still in love with the E24s. The, I love the E46. That's um, nice I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not a hater. Actually, I learned to drive a manual transmission on a brand new um, E36. It, it wasn't an M3. It was... Uh, what I think a 328. I, I worked. I, I worked. Uh, I, I worked at a BMW dealership, and they were like, "You can drive you can drive a stick, right?" And I was just, you know, I'm a kid. I'm like, "Well, yeah, of sure. course I can." Yeah. You know, I, I I remember goofing around with my brother's Ford Escort. You know, way back in the day, that had a manual when it was sitting in the garage with no engine in it. So how hard can it be? So no, we're not BMW haters. No, 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 but, no, no, no. But but BMW also sit down. We need to talk. When did BMW make a V10 for the M2? I think people are know. I, I think I think they know what we're talking about. I'm thinking o- about over it. over New Year's, um, BMW dropped just a little thing on their uh, social media feeds, um, and you know what? It it just happened to be a video drifting into 2021. Um, corrected power slides, smoke everywhere, but. Boy, that didn't sound like an inline six, did it, Bruce? It did not, no. It sounded like a Lamborghini V10. It did, yeah. And you know who noticed? A lot of Ev- people. Everybody. <laughs> yeah, a lot of Everybody people. noticed. Now, BMW, you're supposed to be an enthusiast brand. You've marketed yourself as an enthusiast brand for decades and decades. You know who are really, really particular when it comes to cars? Enthusiasts? Enthusiasts. Yes. So it should be no surprise that BMW picked up or or BMW people picked up on this right away. And then non BMW people picked up on it right away. And then a joke. And then the rest of the world picked up on it right away. Um, You know, we wrote an article that, that I'm showing up here on the screen right now for those on, on YouTube, BMW actually pulled their video down. Um, Not really surprising. Uh, but Jason Camisa, um, he managed to catch it before BMW took it down. And he posed he posed a great question. If these companies can't make a decent ad, why wh- why wonder why they can't make decent cars? You know, it's, I, I, it's, that, it's that's a short punch in a way, because, you know, the advertising team and the engineering team, they aren't the same. But. This point kind of also stands. Well, the the point stands because um, we have to look at a, at a bigger picture here. Yeah, th- this, this, this is was more than just one bad ad. Yeah, I, I mean this this ad was. It's it's like come on BMW, who are you trying to fool here? We know we're enthusiasts. We know what engines sound like, especially a V10. Um, are they making utter crap cars? Well they have the four series with that big grill that has has been universally. Okay. Maybe not universally, but there are so we've seen so much negativity on that grill and it's just like, they're just pushing forward. Like, okay. So I would like to address this. I, I can't call the four series a crap car because I've not driven one, but that design, I and I know design is in, you know, it's a subjective thing. That design is bad. It is. It's bad. They started with the 4 Series, and then naturally it went to the M4, which we all expected. And then for some reason, they put it on the M3. I, which, don't, un- I don't understand the M3, because at one that's... point, I mean, did, did BMW, I, I can't remember, I would have to go back and try to find the specific article, but... I seem to recall at one point BMW saying this is going to be a design cue that sticks with the four series. Right. And they, I almost want to say they said it was almost like an experiment with the four series. Like we're going to do it with the four series. We're going to see how people react. You know, we'll go from there. And just clearly from 
when the cars were designed, the M3 and the M4 must have been on the page at the same time. And so it seems like that uh, that PR message didn't match the actual design message. And we ended up with an M3 with an M4 nose. And it's the ugliest M3 in ages. <laughs> I, I think it's the ugliest M3 period. And, and there's some argument. <laughs> To, to go back to go back earlier, what you were saying, Bruce, about the BRZ and and oh, but but who cares how happy it looks? You're you're driving behind the wheel. How do you feel about the BMW M3? Would you still be having a blast behind the? Okay, yeah, you, you'd have a blast. I'd have a blast behind the wheel. We would all. It, but it's, here's it's a standing that, performance car. But then you think about how it looks, and oh uh, right. no, and a BMW no. has much more of an image around it than a Subaru does. No You're one. Right eyes a Subaru buying into the Subaru image. But people do that with a BMW, that there's a certain, like, there's a class and a style. And then you look at this new M3 and you're like, oh my, why does it have that big nose? Why does it, why does it look like that? And then you look at the 4 Series and you're like, wait, the 4 Series looks like that too? And then you look at the M4 and then if you'll hold on just a second you'll realize that like maybe BMW design has kind of lost its way because here's what we think the refreshed X seven is going to look like. And for anyone who can't see it, just imagine something crawling on you in the middle of the night. That's, that's what it looks like. I'll be a little bit more specific. They move the headlights down so that they're now kind of on the lower edge of the grill. And they're now these like really skinny, what I assume are turn signals, maybe running lights along the upper edge that they split them in half. And it looks like an insect because of the way that the kidney grills are. It looks like, it looks like a fly almost. You can see like the two little sets of wings and I don't know who thought that was a good idea. You know, I, I that doesn't bother me as much as as the grill. Well, and and to be fair, it's not just the grill on the four series and the M4 and the M3. BMW made those cars just extremely busy from a design point. Sure. Too much, too much, in my opinion. It's way over designed up front. The I mean, the big grill obviously gets the attention. But these weird split headlights aren't over designed to you because that reeks of kind of splitting things up for no real reason to me. I don't know that it's over designed. The proportions aren't right. The the, the okay. proportions are completely off. Um, if if we go back to the to the G80 and the GV80, I mean, you you kind of have you know the the split design right there with the lights. It's but, so but, much but, better. But they, well, that's because they match. They're in proportion. Yeah. You you have, I mean, you have basically two separate tiers of lights here that don't really have any sort of relation to each other. And and, and, and you need here, that relation. Um, right. Just super quick. The big grill thing is not, we can't even say it's functional because we're seeing it on the IX, which is a purely electric vehicle, and it still has the massive grill. Yep. And- Oh, I mean, it's definitely a design direction. And to be honest, BMWs in the distant past had these big, long, tall grills. You know, the, the smaller grills that we got used to through the 80s and the 90s um, and, and to some degree still in the 2000s. I, I mean, that's certainly its own era of BMW design. I feel like BMW is trying to take themselves in a new direction, which is fine. But when you start hearing and reading all of the negative feedback that this design direction is taking, there has to come a point where you ask, okay, automaker, are you actually listening to the people that are interested in your brand? Mm -hmm. Are you, are you listening to the people that want to buy your car or are you listening to a small focus group that hopefully you didn't pay a lot of money for because they're <laughs> completely freaking wrong? You know, right. I mean, that's, and, and that, that's how it ties into the video that they posted over New Year's of the M2 with the V10 soundtrack put over top of it. I'm sure it was it was outsourced to some marketing company, and maybe they didn't. I mean, maybe they didn't realize exactly what they were doing. But then again, there must have been somebody at BMW that signed off on that. 
Sure. Now, would BMW even ten years ago had done a video like that, Bruce? Do you think? Do you think that would have gone out with with an obvious engine overlay? I have to assume not. It's not. It's not something that I know that they've done in the past. It just kind of reeks of. Not necessarily. It's, it reeks of inattention. Inattention you know? and and not being attentive of you and your brand of what you're putting out into the world and and not authentic it's it's right. almost uh it's almost like well we don't really care what you people think yeah we're bmw okay you need to you need to care what we think and uh that's 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 a dangerous place to go sure but it but it it, it doesn't just stop there it doesn't just stop with oh no we've with, got with, a with the video about you bmw we've got a little bit more bmw i hope you're sitting down um, some of the, de- some of the decisions they're making when it comes to subscriptions, making people pay extra for items that you wouldn't pay extra elsewhere. Um, I, I think there's, there's the, the heated seat issue that yeah. came up recently. Well, Apple car play was kind of the first one that, that was, that was where it started. Yep. Well, that that's kind of where it started is that there was after a certain period of time I it was either 2 years or 3 years I'm sorry I don't have the information right in front of me you had to pay a subscription to retain Apple CarPlay functionality mm-hmm. and that wouldn't be so bad except that no other automaker really had that that you know if you bought a Honda you just got Apple CarPlay so the fact that if you bought a BMW, that you had to pay for that after whatever grace period, and I apologize, I don't have that info in front of me, that it seemed it felt egregious. Like it felt like they were just Boy. trying to milk their customers for no good reason. Well, that's because they were trying to milk their customers for no good reason. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that it's it's we don't need to sugarcoat that. That's a cash grab. Here's here's a basic option that comes in your car. I mean, you could almost equate it to a bait and switch tactic of the old dealership, uh, you know, from the from the 80s and the 90s and the 70s, and actually it still goes on today. Oh, here's this item. We'll, we'll give it to you for free for a little while, right? For- and then and then you can and then you can pay for it afterwards. Um, yeah, I, I mean it's it's a bait and switch, and they're they're looking to do it now with with heated seats. Yeah, there you go. So we, we got it pulled up, up on uh, for those on YouTube. We got it pulled up here now. And I, 80, I- 80 bucks a year. For Apple CarPlay in your new BMW that you paid probably 80 or 90 grand for. And we do need to be fair that eventually they rescinded that. That it was like an idea that came to them that they thought about it for a while. And then they're like, oh, no, people don't like this. People aren't accepting this. But the very idea that they came up with it, that it got through, I mean... Smith, you know how many meetings we go through to get anything done that Lord knows at a corporation the size of BMW that it had to have gone through several tiers of people that they okayed this and then the backlash hit. They're like, okay, we messed that one up. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, it... it... But it, it, it brings us back to the overarching question at hand here. Is BMW really in touch with its customers anymore? Would 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 BMW have would would BMW of 15 20 years ago gone forward with this big grill after hearing so much, you know, negative backlash? Right. Would BMW of 15 or 20 years ago put out a video overdubbing the sound of one of their best performance cars that you can get right now? The M2 competition is amazing. It is. The, in, the inline 6 is amazing. Is it the best sounding engine? You know what? It's not a bad sounding engine. I, I don't know why they just couldn't have that that engine just singing its own tune. Why do they have to put a V10 in there? And do you, you know? have the tab available of the weird billboards that they were going to try to do in the UK? Oh, 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 oh. I can pull that up right now. As a matter of fact, I have it. Okay, you, here it is right here. Actually. You beat me to it. So, and this, this article, I mean, this came out just, what, a, a few weeks ago? December 24th. So yeah, so, so, so we were talking about if you haven't heard about this, folks, this is a smart billboard that BMW is is promoting. 
Well, and proposed. The, so we, again, much like the subscription plan, they proposed it. It looked like they was going. To, they were going to implement it and then sign it. Some things happened and they switched things around. Well, I, I thought it was still going forward, but it was, it was misunderstood. Let's, let, let's, uh, let's kind of boil this down. Sure. Initially, we thought that the smart billboards we're going to remotely connect to BMWs that obviously had over the air update capability. Well, they were going to scan the number plates in the UK and then, Oh, that's right. The way that the original story said it was shame them. It, that's a bit. It, it would, it would show, it would scan the vehicles and then it would show up basically a personalized message to that yes. owner saying, Hey, your BMWs warranty is about to expire or is out of warranty. Maybe you should think about getting another one. You know, just right. maybe you should extend crazy. your factory factory. Eh, I can't tell factory warranty. Basically, d- giving the big brother impression of big brother BMW is watching you wherever you drive, and and, and it, it kind of had that that kind of spooky feel to it. Now right. they 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 did walk it back, right? Kind of. So they are still scanning the number plates in the UK, but it is now if your vehicle is older than a certain period, then it puts up a message saying, Hey, you should renew your factory warranty. So it doesn't specifically name a person, but if there is a BMW in the line at the stoplight and it sees that that person is sitting there, then it puts that information up, which is still feels creepy. It's hell. It still feels very creepy. I mean, even, even if they aren't, dipping into personal information, even if they can just tell, okay, that's a, that's a 2015 BMW. Let's, let's, uh, you know, let's put this targeted ad up there. I mean, what it's like basically is, is targeted ads on the internet, right? right. It's like they're pulling, oh, they're taking it into, into real car and that like you're getting the targeted ad. Oh, you visited. I don't know what site. Maybe you want X, Y, Z. Like it's right. just creepy. And, and once again, would BMW of 15 years ago have, have done that? I mean, it, it it feels like they're just not really considering their consumer the way right. they it used to like be. A cash put- like we want you, we want to get, we want to ring every last pound since this is in the UK of you that we can. That you know, we want every cent, and it it just. And there's nothing like more it, morally wrong with it. It just feels creepy, like that you would do that and like put that ad up in traffic. And maybe like that's a weird minority report type thing. But I'm no, just I'm, not. I'm, I'm, I'm with one. you, and that and that's why we're talking about this. Yeah. Um, what happened to the days of just BMW being the ultimate driving machine? I mean, mm-hmm. that was a that was a simple that was a simple ad campaign. And they had the vehicles to back it up. BMW makes amazing performance vehicles, amazing oh, luxury vehicles right now. Yeah. But but I feel like they're acting like a sleazy used car dealership. That move certainly is. And it just seems like it feels like one side isn't talking to the other. Because every point that we've put out here, that's a different side of the company. That's BMW UK on one side. It's BMW design on another side. It's whoever the tech people are. But all of those things together, it just paints the portrait of a company that doesn't quite see a concerted way forward, that they don't know where they're going, and everyone is kind of flailing to get their own little bit of the pie while, while they can. And it just looks bad for a historically great German brand, especially when you compare them to Mercedes Benz, which the new S class looks fantastic. It does. I mean, maybe it does. it's a little cookie cutter ish, but from the spy shots we've seen, the C class looks like a mini S class. Like Mercedes seems to have Mercedes seems to know where it's going this coming week. We're going to see, or maybe, maybe it's next week, whatever virtual C- CES is. Um, We're going to see the new EQS, which is going to be their flagship Tesla fighting electric car. And it's going to have this massive uh, virtual display that spans the entire dashboard. Like you look at Mercedes and you're like, oh, that's a company that knows where it's going. Everyone is on board and going in the same direction. 
Then you see BMW and the design team isn't quite right. The tech team is like trying to pull somebody out of people. Like no one is quite on board and it's a, am I wrong here? Like, do, do you see what I'm seeing? I, I do. I think they, I, I think the, their direction is a little more focused than, uh, than maybe you believe. Okay. But, but, but I think the problem is they they're set in one specific direction and they're not going to listen to anybody else. Tell them how to get there because damn it, they're BMW. Sure. They know how to get there and no company, no business gets to where they need to go just by making the decisions that they think they have to make. They need to listen to their audience. They need to listen to the people that are buying their vehicles and they need to stop acting as like, like cheap used car salesmen. I mean, I mean, I, that that's, that's what strikes me more than anything in this. They're, they're trying to get a cash grab anywhere they can, which, Hey, businesses, you need to make profit. That's mm-hmm. fine. So maybe they're dipping a toe into some of these subscription services. And you know what? I hate to say that Cadillac has followed suit a little bit with their super cruise. Well, and that's going to go throughout GM soon that we're going to see it'll, that the GMC and the show go throughout GM. Yep. And, yeah. And you know what? I mean, I, I don't want to. I don't want to draw on any stereotypes. I wonder if some manufacturers maybe are a little more prone to it than others. I wouldn't expect this from BMW. You kind of said this earlier. I I, I wouldn't expect BMW, a, a, a brand with with the history that it has, to go for the cheap cash grabs. You know, yeah. I wouldn't expect BMW to make a Cadillac Cimarron. I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. I, yeah, they, they they wouldn't make a Cadillac Cimarron, um, but now I'm starting to wonder if they're thinking about it. And it's BMW doesn't feel like BMW, okay? BMW BMW feels like an alter world copy that Skynet made because it has this overarching plan of global domination, and they're just going to kind of shove this down the people's throats until one day they wake up and their cars kill them. I don't know. I, maybe I went, maybe I went to a dark place there. Yeah. I, I have been binge watching Westworld for a while. I, I think I could put that same point a slightly different way is yes, that please, please any do. business has to balance profits versus customer satisfaction. And so you, in our industry, you could run a website with absolutely zero ads with the greatest content in the world and make zero money. And on the opposite of that, you could charge $2,000 a year and copy the content from everybody else and not do anything. And there's a balance there. And it feels like right now, BMW is very much more in a place where it wants to extract profits over customer value. And it hasn't felt that way in the past. That there has been, I'm thinking the E46, E36, E39 BMWs, where those were certainly luxury products. No one can doubt that. But that they gave a certain value for money when you bought them. Mm -hmm. You know, you spent a premium and you got a premium. Whereas right now it feels like you spend that premium and they want a little bit more going. Yeah, it's it's like you spend the premium and you get the premium for a little while and then you get that for three years and then by the 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 way, yeah, yeah, why don't you why don't you pay us again for what you already bought? Yeah. Um, and, and, oh, then, you know, when we catch you, you know, going down the highway, we're going to see you and remind you that, you know, you need to buy our extended warranty. And, and I mean, it's like, where does it go from there? Right. BM, BMW, we want, we want you back. We love you, BMW. We really Certainly. do. But what you're doing right now, when, when you say, oh, we don't mind that aftermarket companies are offering new front faces for our cars. Do you have that link to share real quick? Or? You, you I, I don't have that in front okay. of me, but it's like, you it, should yeah. mind. You should mind. Why wouldn't you be upset that companies are making different front, front faces to put on your cars 
because people want them. I was, I was just, I mean, that, that's another example of Here, here it comes. BMW, BMW, what are you doing? You know? And oh. these, these aftermarket front faces, they, they make the cars look pretty good. At least according to the renderings we've seen, like you can yeah. make a four series look pretty attractive. Here it is. Okay. Let's, let's, let's take a look here. Is that up for you? Yeah, the, it, it's up. It's up. It's still. It's it's a picture of the. Uh, it's still right, you just can see the headline though. BMW yeah. design boss fine with people customizing a new four series. Um, let me see if I can scroll <laughs> down and get to the. Daniel, I love his subhead. It's like everybody hates it now. It's official. Yeah, you know, we have either. certain offerings at BMW. They are very expressive piece. Expressive is an interesting word, certainly. Or you can even put on aftermarket parts and great wheels and stuff like this. So, yeah, it's weird that even BMW is admitting if you don't, if this isn't for you, we understand you changing it. And here's the thing: a front fascia like this isn't that hard to change. No, and BMW had ample, ample warning that you know what maybe people weren't going to be too hot on this big grill design yeah because they showed it on concepts and people are like no 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 this nope, isn't great no 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 and we saw what chevrolet did with the camaro yeah um, the next year they refreshed it like a word yeah yeah just, right. a, just a simple a simple refresh now i didn't think the i didn't think the camaro redesign looked that bad I didn't either, actually i i think i think the i think their update looks better but we know manufacturers can do that yeah so with all the negative feedback hey you know what they've got the four series already in the bank okay let's go with this for a while maybe maybe it'll grow on people but then okay now here it comes for the m3 the three series didn't have that grill to start with there's no reason no. the m3 needed that needed that design absolutely not now we're seeing it on on the other electric vehicles they, yeah, yeah. they don't yeah. even need a grill so yeah, it all comes together to paint a concerning picture of BMW. What's wrong? Where are you going? What are you thinking? So I think we hit that point pretty hard. And again, I don't want this to sound like we hate BMWs. There's a guy up my street that has a, what, an E39? Is that the late 90s 5 Series? Yes. Yes, the E39. Yep. He has one of those. And if it ever goes up for sale, I might end up buying it. Like, I, I, I do have a real love for BMWs, especially the inline six models, because I feel yep. like BMW made inline sixes practically like no one else. Like, you could put them against anyone in the world. Um, just, and we're saying this, we're saying this because we want that BMW back. Exactly. You could you could still have that BMW today, even right. with with electric power. You can still have that involvement. You can still have BMW personality. Absolutely. We're, we're just we're hoping BMW changes some course here. Exactly. And I th and I think with all the evidence we have here, there's there's evidence to say, okay, maybe there's something a little bit more going on here. What do you so, think, folks? Email us at podcast at motor one .com. Are we, right. are we crazy? Are we talking about conspiracy theories here? Yeah. Are we out of touch? Like it's possible. It's like uh, Smith and I have covered the auto industry or worked in the auto industry between us for decades. And so maybe we don't know what the average person wants anymore. I don't feel that way. I, uh, maybe I'm wrong, <laughs> but like maybe we're way off. And if we are, go I don't ahead so. tell us. I don't think so. I think we got this pretty well covered. But yeah, yeah I, email I, podcast at motor1.com. Yeah. You can catch us on YouTube. You can catch us on Apple. Yeah. Um, we're coming to Spotify soon. Yes. So that's the thing. Um, you will definitely see us on YouTube and Apple Podcasts at first. I, I need to talk to some people about getting our Spotify working again. If there are any other services like the, especially podcast services like your spotify your podcast whatever um let me know send it to podcast at motor one.com and we'll try to get on there um but yeah so i if you're watching this you are probably watching it on the post that we put up on motor one.com so i thank you for watching it if you're listening to it 
I suspect you're still a subscriber on Apple iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Again, to me, they're still the same thing. Um, so thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Um, and I hope you come back. And again, don't be afraid to contact us. We want your feedback. We want your questions. If there's a car you're thinking about buying, whether it's a new car or an old car, let us know. If there's a question you have, if there's a advice you want, if there's an opinion you have, just, just let us know because we want to have fun here and we want to give our opinions. Uh, the other thing that I want to address is that we do plan on having a third person on this podcast from time to time, whether that's a member of Motor One, whether it's one of you, whether it's someone who has a particularly cool car. So, you know, if you've got a cool car that you want to talk about and, you know, maybe, I, I you know, I can't make any promises, but shoot it out to us and maybe you'll be a guest. So here's here's yeah. a secret that I know all of the commenters on the articles might find extraordinary. Bruce and I are car people. Yeah. Can, can you imagine that? We're, we're car people and we write about cars. We we love to chat about cars. We love to ramble about cars. We'll ramble with executives at Ford or GM or Audi or Porsche. Or, or your buddy that has that cool Unimog that he imported. Or Yeah, or you listening right now. So come join us on this crazy ride. Yeah. So we thank you. Um, thank you for listening. And yeah, we hope you enjoyed this time. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. We'll see you.